Today we talk about uh, being a reflective practitioner as an educator. Welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 22, this day, September 15, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart, calling from lovely Aguascalientes. Hello, this is Piri Herrera, also from Aguascalientes, uh, hoping that you are having a nice weekend this time and um, getting ready for the celebration here in Mexico. We Tonight, we celebrate the Independence Night. Uh, we call it uh, El Grito the independencia and uh tomorrow 16 it's the independence day here in mexico so uh looking forward for celebration tonight <laughs> absolutely i know you play uh, music uh Petey. do you have any plans for uh, playing uh this yeah weekend? actually uh I'm, I'm i'm working at a joint at, at night uh, a latin place a cuban place so i'm gonna be right there i'm gonna i'm gonna be playing at a party uh, for a birthday and a little bit of uh, Mexican music for the Independence Day. And then afterwards, I'm heading towards uh, this uh, small restaurant just to have some salsa a little bit there. <laughs> awesome. But, um, uh, enjoying enjoying all these times and all, also enjoying the talks here at Teacher Learning Cast every Saturday, a 15 in the morning. Join us. Join us. Yeah, we uh, had about two weeks ago, we started sharing the live broadcasting link in our Facebook page. If you follow us, uh, we have a dedicated page for Teacher Learning Cast. And each week, we are not only posting the YouTube broadcast page, if you just want to watch us uh, through that site, you can also join us in the actual live broadcast, which is always uh, rec being recorded and made available to uh, everyone uh, after the fact. So, we're uh, just waiting, uh, PD. One of these days, I think we'll have somebody pop in uh, just on the fly, uh, which would be great uh, to join into our, with our discussion. Uh, this week, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, reflective uh, practitioners as, as educators. How can we reflect a little bit more in our own practice? I know we've talked about this topic in the past, PD. And uh, last week, you kind of gave us a little bit of uh, insight into flow. And uh, those are some of the things we want to talk about today. But if you're following us in Facebook, uh, feel free to leave comments. You can leave comments throughout the show because I know Peter is uh, fielding uh, questions there. I am fielding questions in the YouTube broadcast page, which again is uh, available in the Facebook page. And uh, feel free to leave comments during the broadcast as well as afterwards as well. We uh, continually uh, check throughout the week in, uh, in our Facebook page. So if you're leaving comments, we uh, do appreciate those. And uh, let us know different topics that you would like us to discuss in the future. And any topics we've talked in the past, if you just want to leave some of your experiences and insights, that's what this uh, broadcast is all about, is uh, finding ways to continue the conversation, broaden the conversation, and bring in more educators, not only within our immediate uh, reach uh, with whom we have contact, but uh, those educators really from around the world who have similar interests. So we encourage everyone to uh, be a part uh, and have a voice and share your opinions. Yes, uh, one of the advantages of being a teacher is that uh, the teaching world is always in movement. So there's always something to talk about. There's always something to discuss. There's always something to retake and, and rediscover from different angles. So we've been uh, having these discussions for 22 episodes now, and we hope to keep on going and, and uh, inviting you all to tell us, give us some feedback about uh, whatever you think about the things we, we uh, talk in here in this show. You know, we have uh, a lot of students that we see, you know, throughout the years and, and uh, Petey and I both have uh, been in the, in the field for some time now. So we, we've got a, lo a long list of uh, egresados, graduates who have left our, our BA and are now in the field doing wonderful things. So I, I want to personally invite those, uh, those 
students who have graduated in the past that we know um, are doing great things uh, to share your comments uh, and share your experiences. I, I think we, the whole idea is that we try to find ways to network uh, with each other and find uh, greater opportunities uh, to to learn and expand our, our reach. So I just want to throw that out there. If those uh, graduates who have uh, maybe left our program and are are working in the field, not only here locally, but abroad as well, uh, to feel free to reach out to us if you want to be part of the broadcast and uh, and add some of your insights. Right, uh, and to get into the subject matter today, um, I, I'd like to retake, Ben, if you allow me, um, a little bit of what uh, I was given away last week as a heads up for what was coming in the academic week here at the Universidad Autónoma de Huascalientes in, in the Congress we had Monday and Tuesday. And uh, just retaking very quickly what we were discussing that day, we were talking about the theory of flow from Dr. Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, I think I'm, I'm still uh, struggling with that pronunciation. And uh, uh, kind of just to refresh your audience, this is something we discussed um, last uh, cast, episode 21. And uh, I'm going to share my screen a little bit here so you can uh, just very quickly see what we discuss. Now, can you see my screen, Ben, now? Yes, I see it. Okay, that's Dr. Uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, I think that's the pronunciation, at a conference, indeed. And uh, we discussed um, a little bit about his uh, diagram, his uh, primary diagram for the theory of flow, uh, in which uh, we very quickly mentioned uh, we focus a little bit on the teaching aspect during the conference i focus a little bit more on students and teaching aspect in which the theory goes with the idea of uh doing our activities in general in life through the the, the channel flow in which we have a balance from the challenges we face in every action we do we take we every action we have to uh perform in our professional or personal life um, and have a balance between the challenges that it represents and the skills that uh, we have for them. And we were adding last week, we were uh, making a comment that it's something uh, beyond only skills. It's something a little bit more like integral, looking at the human being as a, as a, a, a human that uh, has many planes, so it's not only about the skills, but it's also about the knowledge, the attitudes, and uh, uh, the behaviors we have towards the different situations. And the point in here, indeed, uh, Dr. Uh, Csikszentmihalyi, he has the idea that this is the way to reach happiness, and that's the way he puts it. And, and he works a lot with... Uh, uh, academics, he works with business people, he works with uh, uh, artists. He, all his studies were done in different planes, sport people, artists, businessmen, and uh, there are several things in which they all uh, meet uh, certain uh, expectations and certain characteristics which, characteristics which lead uh, to this theory uh, to be enriched. Indeed, uh, nowadays we have different... Um, uh, uh, development of this chart, which has different levels of uh, not only anxiety, but different levels of situations. And, and in both planes, it's a little bit changed. But this is the basic diagram in which we go from one activity to our flow. So this is pretty much what we discussed last week and, and, and what I wanted to share with you with the idea of leading towards uh, reflection, with the idea of leading towards um, uh, the starting point, because, I mean, if you want to get into details about this theory, uh, you can read about it. You can start by by looking at the episode 21, where we discuss a little bit about it. But the idea is to get to uh, how do I get into the flow? How do I get back in track? How do I balance my challenge and skills? And uh, there are different things to do. Sometimes you, the challenges are high, so you have to take your time to develop your knowledge, your skills, to control your emotions and attitudes in order to be able to, to, to put up with the challenge, to, to, 
to cope with whatever is in front of you. And other times the challenge is at a low bar and um, your skills, your capacities are quite beyond the challenge. And that's also something that is not that good. That's a, that's a theory about. And that's the moment in which you have to start looking for new challenges, maybe different activities or the same activity at a different uh, degree of performance, of challenge. If not from your, uh, talking about work, if not from your school, if not from your boss, uh, from yourself, looking for a new way to do things, changing. The other day, I was listening to a psychologist uh, the other day, children psychologist, talking about the idea of um, uh, changing your, your driveway to school when you take your kids to school and how that has a great impact on kids once they realize you are changing a path. I mean, just make it, try to make obvious that you are changing a path somehow. And she was discussing about this and, uh, and it starts to develop certain abilities, connections in the brain, uh, uh, just by the fact a simple activity like changing the street you are driving through to get your kids to school. So something like that can be done in, in, in the situation in which the challenge is not high enough for your skills or your capacities. You can also um, do something simple just to change the plane in which you are working and start developing. Now, uh, this is a whole new talk. We can discuss about different strategies and different ways to uh, cope with uh, a big challenge or cope with a low challenge activity in which your skills are way above or your skills are down the, the bar. Uh, but I think before getting into that talk, which we can, uh, maybe we will touch today somehow, we will border it or, or we can approach it in, in, a further, in a further show, in a further cast. Uh, I think before getting into the strategies and the way to do it, we need to start with uh, the basic, which is uh, knowing where you are, knowing what you want and how you want it. And that's that was pretty much the idea of the talk I gave. Uh, and, and that's why I, I focus a little bit on, on the theory of flow to get into reflection. The idea that everything depends on, uh, I'm going to share my screen again very quickly, Ben, just mm -hmm. to jump into the topic. <clears throat> the idea of, uh, and there it is, everything related to our attitudes, our behaviors, and in fact, uh, whatever we have inside of ourselves, transforming uh, whatever needs to be transformed, uh, persisting and reinforcing whatever aspects are working for us in life as something positive. And it all starts at a point uh, in which I consider it's reflection. Reflection which comes at all moment, at every single instant, whether conscious, whether, whether well thought and whether following um, a pattern, a system, or following a model for reflection, or whether just uh, um, making impromptu decisions and quick things without any uh, uh, real format. Uh, anyhow, reflection has to be there. But in this case, uh, departing from the idea of looking for the best way to get into the flow, to get into our activities and have that balance between challenges and capacities and, and coping with whatever is in front of us, I think the beginning before doing and taking any action can be reflection. And that's what we uh, will focus a little bit more today. Ben? Okay, yeah, and I want to kind of unpack some of these ideas here because you make some interesting points. And I think, again, we talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, the main takeaway for me, looking at that graphic that you introduced again today, uh, is the idea that we're never... Uh, we never stay in one place, right? So if we are reaching out and trying to uh, challenge ourselves that we're either going to increase our skills and knowledge over time, or if not, we're just going to come back down and we're not going to keep uh, challenging ourselves, right? Because uh, we're not, we're always going to want to uh, go 
towards this idea of equilibrium where we enter this state of flow that you you mentioned and ideally we want to kind of move up the river so to speak right we want to continue right. increasing both our challenges and our skills and knowledge but i i want to take um a few minutes if i if i can here to maybe throw out another perspective and try to look at the complexity of reflection yeah. and but also see some different ways of getting into reflection because i know peter you have had a lot of experience with uh, teacher trainers and i wanted to get some of your insight and some of some of these points that i want to talk about today so uh let me jump right into it here and i'm going to start by sharing my screen and i think in a prior broadcast of teacher learning cast i think i talked about this idea of flipped learning and i talked about this idea of moving towards this ideal self and a lot of what i talk about today with regard to reflection has a lot to do with this same the same notion now uh, i put together this as i know really sloppy here but i'm gonna try to explain a little bit about my current thoughts about reflective uh, practice and specifically for teachers and it starts kind of in the middle where you have your current self so your current beliefs your ideas that you talked about your attitudes speedy those are uh, all in reference to this idea of current self where are you right now in your belief system your perspectives your practice etc and if you look at the other side of this there's going to be a gap between your ideal self where you would like to be versus where you currently are and really the whole idea of, of a reflective practice is to close this gap, is to find ways that, that the current self can reach this ideal self over time. So if you look at the center part of the circle here, we have uh, what I've labeled teaching learning context. And so for me, the first thing that comes to mind is your immediate context, uh, your school that you're working in, your colleagues with whom you work with, your students, of course, maybe admins, it could even be parents, any educational stakeholders that are responsible, that are directly responsible for the current learning context that you find yourself in, uh, that would include this center circle. So all of these conversations that you're having, these interactions that you're having, um, and the, the overall culture of the school, of the way that uh, individuals communicate, are going to influence uh, this attempt in closing the gap between the ideal and current self. And so again, culture comes to mind. Available resources is, of course, going to be a factor, uh, depending on what type of technologies, for example, that are available. Those That's going to indicate a lot how uh, school members or colleagues are going to interact with each other, right? How open is the communication? Um, how willing are teachers to make... Uh, or cha to challenge themselves to take risks and how much is that going to be part of their teacher evaluation all of that comes into play when when we think about teachers challenging themselves and then reflecting on their own practice right because they can teachers as we know can practice and reflect internally and not really share that with anyone or they can start sharing their practices and their uh, experiences uh, with others, all right? And so there's a, a lot of different variables that go into play, but you have this immediate context where you've got direct contact with your, your personal learning network, if you will. I typically refer to these interactions as a, as a personal learning network, but how, does, how do teachers interact and then reflect and share those experiences? And then you've got this outside layer, this outer layer, that are more in terms of external influences, right? So this, these can be external colleagues or experts. It could also be the literature, all of the, any articles and research that is made available uh, that relates to uh, the teacher and how the teacher is trying to close this gap between the ideal and current self. Uh, this is all also part of these external um, influences that also will influence the current uh, teaching and learning context. I also include in this category of external experts and literature, this outer circle uh, as PAR, participatory action research. And this is kind of another layer of communication where teachers themselves can 
actually take an active role in in doing their own research as part of the reflective practice, right? So these are all possible ways that I see a teacher can incorporate reflective practice, again, not only within the local context, but expanding that out outward to external experts, and then also having this piece of uh, the research where they can actually be part of their, they can actually be the researcher and also the teacher in the same context. And it, I see that as actually another layer or another opportunity to bring reflective practice to a new level. Yes, I can. Uh, this is pretty much what we were discussing last uh, Tuesday in the talk I was giving with some of the people that was uh, in the talk. Uh, precisely, uh, that's kind of uh, the idea um, that I had when, when I mentioned that um, uh, there are moments in which you have to take a time and cope with your skills or your capacities in order to reach uh, the level required for the challenge. And, and it's something very similar to this in which you can go back to, uh, uh, I don't know, studying a book, an author, a colleague, a course, a teacher, a conference, uh, I don't know. And, and, and I was, indeed, I was mentioning a couple of ideas like if you have, if it's a task which requires certain expertise in a certain area, let's say technology, and that's where you need to raise the bar, well, that's where you have to go to, to the experts and to people that can actually help you with that people that actually have a little bit more of experience on the field or has the, uh, something that can help you to cope with that idea. Same thing if the, what you need is a little bit more of strategies and direct uh, techniques for the classroom, well, then you go to authors, to books, to colleagues, to whatever you need, but it has to be also the expert, someone who has been there, who has experienced that and can uh, help you to develop your own ideas on how on on how to cope with that situation, and it also goes for the personal plane. If you have uh, different individual things you have to cope with, well, if you have legal problems, you go to lawyers. If you have health problems, you go to doctors. If you have sentimental problems or feelings problems, you go to psychologists. If you have a serious uh, way beyond uh, brain problems, well, you go to the psychiatrist and and we can go on and go on and on and on. But that's pretty much the idea to, to look for the way to cope with uh, all of the aspects that can enhance our current situation when the challenge requires for you to step up for the next uh, step in the stair. Yeah, and... And to really add another piece to this, because I think most of us, you know, few people would say, you know, it, there's no value in reflective practice. And I mean, I think most of us would agree that, yes, we're, we need to reflect on our own practice. And probably if you ask most teachers, they're going to say, yes, of course, I, I reflect on my practice. But I think the one of the things I want to try to talk about today is looking at it from um, a very practical way and seeing how we can discuss very concretely what it means to be a reflective practitioner and, and really the complexities and really trying to find the best ways to do this. The, the thing I want to add to the, my discussion here about trying to close this gap between the ideal self and the current self is, is Sean's notion of reflection in action versus reflection on action. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked about a lot about this uh, PD, but, um, you know, if we think about the expert teacher, quote unquote expert teacher, or the skillful uh, educator, um, he or she's going to probably have a different level of reflection in action, being able to actually reflect in the moment what's going on and being able to identify what's going on as as being uh, is is something that should be happening in the classroom, something that's going well versus something that needs to change. And, you know, I think this is something you see a lot with some of your, your, your student teachers is really trying to help them develop the skill of how to reflect in action. I think reflecting on action, reflecting after the fact, looking at having, uh, having teachers reflect on what they did in the past, 
is something that we normally think about when we think about reflection. But I wonder if we think enough about reflection in action and, and really finding ways that we can improve the skill of this awareness of what's going on in the moment and then being able to make subtle changes in the moment um, and then subsequent moments, maybe in later classes, but based on those those particular times where maybe something's not going right, uh, maybe you know the behavior of the students is not what was intended, uh, the learning objectives are not being met for whatever reason, uh, there's some sort of challenge that's happening, and that students are first able to become aware of those moments, those moments where students are off task, that objectives aren't being met, and then second, being able to make slight adjustments in the moment uh, to either rectify the situation or at least try to minimize the the issues that are that are being uh, that are happening there in the moment. And I don't know if uh, you've had some of these discussions with some of your teacher trainers, PD, about about really how to develop this reflection in action. And I'm curious what steps that you take or what kind of conversations you've had with some of your students in trying to develop this idea of reflection in action in the moment so that students are able to increase their awareness of their own teaching practice? Well, the first thing, yeah, yeah this is a recurring talk, but uh, the first thing to be aware is that we are dealing with human beings and everybody is different. So there is not a right formula and there's not just one path to go through uh, when it comes to uh, self-development in that sense. Um, and um, in, in fact, this week we had that sort of that talk. Uh, it was based a little bit on uh, lesson planning, but with the idea and, and somehow the way I managed the idea of lesson planning and the importance of planning a class, it's, uh, it's also based on reflection. The lesson plan or, or the moment of or actually sitting down to plan your class, whether you write it or not, whether you have a format to fill out or um uh, a little bit of a little pieces of card little pieces of cards or, or or a list to do or whatever any way you plan your class that's a moment of reflection and why do i bring that in this comment because uh, i think it's quite uh, mm, a similar process to what you were mentioning about the inaction decisions in the class reflections at the moment where they have to uh, take some decisions Make, make decisions that will uh, uh, help their students better during classes. And it's a process. We were discussing about the idea that right now they're taking, these are beginners, teachers that are teaching for the first time in uh, teaching worship. And um, it's like their sixth or seventh class in, in a year. Uh, I mean, in, in, because we are working with theory and I think we've discussed this before in, in prior um programs of how, how the dynamic is for this course but the idea is that they are beginners and they are taking uh they have to take time for planning and that's one of the first things i struggle with that they don't they don't give relevance to the time that they have to invent, invest in planning which is a time for reflection then the talk about it is that they have to do it at this moment in the time whatever time they need to do it and the idea is to reduce that time little by little in such a way that they start having things that have been already planned, reflections that have already been done before. And whenever you come to certain points in the path in which certain things occur, you already have a background of similar things, of similar aspects. Um, uh, and then you can start making a, a quick reflection and start making a quick decision, which becomes kind of a plan again. I had a base plan, I had a plan before the class, but now that I'm in the class, I need to make this in-progress decision based on reflection, reflection and feedback. And how do you do it? How do you cope with uh, managing a class and 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 uh, and uh, trying to carry out whatever you plan and trying to make students, help students to develop whatever they have to develop that day, but at the same time being aware of the reflection itself of the situation and uh, something that 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 I've heard you uh, mention Ben is about feedback noticing about the feedback that you have in the classroom and then trying to make this decision but I think it's a, 
Uh, there may be different ways to go through this, but the idea is that it takes time. But it takes time because at the first time you need to start by the the, the small things, but by the by the like in little steps. Doctor Jakes uh, mentions that um, before taking the next step, you need to reaffirm the one you have before because uh, it's going to be a great challenge to take the next step in the stair if you're walking up it when your foot is not well extended. And once you are firm, strong, and, and ready to take the next step, you take the next step and you face yourself in the situation that the challenge, again, has to be rebalanced with the capacities that you have in order to continue in this flow. So all of this that I'm seeing, uh, all of these ideas uh, about the reflection in action, reflection on action, and all of this uh, uh, different layers that you're managing, Ben, for, for reflection, it all applies. And I think uh, uh, that it depends on each uh, person how it starts. There will be some teachers that immediately can deal with uh, making these connections in their mind and flowing immediately into reflection and knowing how to take action. Uh, even though they are beginners, sometimes they have certain innate skills or, or, or prior knowledges which are easily reapplied to whatever they're going to do in teaching. For example, I can talk about my case. What I used to do at the beginning of my teaching, and I keep on doing it now, is that I recall every single activity that I perform in a group, in different groups that I've been uh, in any nature. Uh, just a case in point, let's say the Boy Scouts. I was never in the Boy Scouts, but let's suppose I was in the Boy Scouts. Uh, where you have uh, this social relationship and different kind of activities which help you to develop certain skills, attitudes, and behaviors. And then that's the way I started teaching, just readapting whatever I saw there as a participant. I put myself into the position of the director of the activities. And, uh, and, and that's the way I, I was coping with it. And it's not because I had a, a, a major facility to do so, but maybe I had a little bit more of experience. So I started in that way. Some other people may start with the idea of I need to nurture myself from the books, from the authors, from strategies, from techniques. And I have the capacity to uh, have a clear picture in my mind of what the authors intend to mean. And I have a, 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 the facility to make it a transition between the book and the actual happening in the classroom. I don't know. There's people that work like that and, and, uh, uh, and it's amazing to be able to do this kind of things, but I know there's people that they can do it. So, so it it's all about it. It's all about um, just uh, taking your moment to reflect and see what is working for you in that sense, in order to diminish that gap that you're mentioning between the current self and the ideal self, in order to shrink that gap precisely. That's pretty much the idea. Now. Um, just to wrap up this idea uh, with, with the reflection in action and reflection on action, yes, uh, I think they all go, it, it all goes through the same, um, let's say, path at a different speed and different uh, requirement of abilities and capacities from the teacher uh, because oh, it's demanding. It's demanding and every single demand requires support. And that support, it's different for every people, and it takes different times, different paces. Yeah, and you know, your point about the importance of planning uh, is certainly uh, important to mention and something to consider when you're reflecting. But I'm wondering if there comes a point where the actual process of planning can overshadow one's ability to reflect in action. So I'm thinking about a case where let's say that a teacher is using the book primarily, right? And, mm -hmm. and there's a course book and he or she's really sticking to the book, primarily going page to page throughout the activities using that book. Now you could say that the quote unquote planning for that class basically is the book, right? There's not a lot mm -hmm. of difference in that type of scenario where you've got planning being much different than what's coming in the book because he or she's using the course book. So I'm wondering 
for those who are really planning and really trying to stick to a plan, if the process of trying to stick to that plan can um, actually hinder or cause more problems when uh, the teacher's trying to reflect in action, not so much thinking about reflecting on action after the fact, but really in that moment, because again, the purpose here for that teacher is really trying to get to page 15 by the end of the day or trying to, to get to X amount of activities that he or she planned for that particular day. And maybe the act, the act of reflecting in class becomes a greater challenge. Have you seen that? Have you talked about that uh, with some of your students? And yeah. how do you really deal with that yeah, ben. and, and, and yeah. really work with the students to say, okay, yes, planning is important but you also need to be aware of the situation and being right. able to react uh, in real time. You know, it all depends. And, and, and yeah, you're making a, a very good point because this is, this is the job. This is exactly what I struggle with. The concept of planning. What do you believe planning is? What do you think? And how do you handle your perception of a plan? Uh, yes, I, when you mention p uh, teachers that want to stick to a plan, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's where we have to start, right, in that sense. And that's why I compare planning to reflecting, because it's not about the idea of having a plan to stick to or filling the format, which we have to do sometimes. I mean, you have to cooperate and you have to be part of a team and you have to fulfill requirements in your school. So you have to fill out your formats or whatever you are asked to do. But that's a format. That's not a plan. That's just filling out a format. I'm talking about the real idea of a plan of a class, whether a book or not. You can base your planning because there is a book to follow and they require you to follow the book. But yes, the idea is what is the concept of a plan? Is it something you have to really prescribe and stick to? Or is it something flexible? In short, not to get into a lot of detail, planning, uh, the way I consider planning with my students and I try to make them aware of this is that it's just a, a guide, a preparation of, um, uh, it's a preparation of a guide for the classroom in order for not losing the objectives. And, uh, and let me put an example about this, a clear example. Many students, especially beginners, they always ask me uh, to read their lesson plans and to, they say, correct. They say, correct my lesson plan. Do you have any comments about correcting? Do I have to change anything? Do I have to do anything? And they, most of the time, and I would dare to say all of the times when I have these kind of comments, these are students that want me to tell them about the activities they have decided to perform in the classroom. And that's something I never do. I never ask them to change any activity, not to pre-service teachers, not to teachers that are really learning from it. And I never ask them to change anything. I may stress certain aspects of their planning whenever, uh, just to make sure that I'm understanding what they're writing. And just to make sure that that's what they mean and make them reflect on whatever they want to do. But my main focus on checking a lesson plan is the perception of the objective that they have for the class. What they want to achieve as a base for whatever happened next can change, can be flexible. You can take your in-progress decisions. You can make these quick reflections. And that's what I'm leaning towards when I'm with them to help them to be able to make these quick decisions. I, I tell them there is no improvisation in the classroom. When you improvise, uh, and, I, and I do the quotation marks, when you improvise something, you don't come up with something out of the blue. You come up with something you already know. You have experienced before somehow. Yes, you may transform it, transform it and readapt it for the moment. But uh, I would dare to say that most of the times it's something you have pre uh, priorly planned somewhere along your life in a different group, in a different moment, in a different situation. You saw it yourself when you, when you were studying. But whenever you decide to make a change in your class, 
you have things that you have done before and you have experiences in there. So going back to the idea of, of this in, in interruption of the planning into the in-progress decision, I think it depends if you are thinking about the lesson plan as a book to follow, as something is strict that cannot be changed. Yes, that will always interfere because that's not really uh, planning. That's just checking what you're going to do. <laughs> well, yes, it's a plan, but it's not really uh, my concept of planning. Indeed, um, I tend to ask my students to, to change their way of planning in any way that they can actually use it in the classroom if needed. And I'm surprised when they tell me, can I change things? Can I improvise like activities or something? And I go again to the same talk. It's not about improvisation. It's about uh, what, are, what would you change? Well, if I say this, I would try to do a different kind of activity to activate them. And I was like, are you going to make up the activity at the moment? No, you are going to use one that you know before, something that you, that you master or something that you can readapt because it comes to your mind. So... The idea is to help them planning and make this idea of a very flexible plan in which is just a guide for whatever you are going to do and have this uh, plan become a strong reflection and get them used to reflecting and reflecting. Who are my students? Is this, is this going to work because of what reason? Uh, what am I going to use? Is the context appropriate? How am I going to stress the context? How do I base myself? Uh, uh, is this activity helping this, the, the use of the language? Is supporting the use of the language? Is it helping students to develop what I intend to develop? Is this activity, I mean, all of this doing it kind before. So when you actually get into the classroom and you start to see students' reactions, and, and there was a teacher, uh, somebody, I, I Kind of, I kind of uh, try to, to remember always his name. And he mentioned, just look into their eyes, look into their eyes and see their reactions and then start getting that feedback from them at the moment. And then in that moment, exactly the same idea for the planning, reflecting, thinking, considering the students, language topic, language context, the function of the language, uh, the exposure time to the language, the time they're going to be practicing, uh, considering all of these aspects, gets to be more regular in them when planning. And the idea is that from there, they start to take it into the classroom itself. At the moment of taking any action, just making that quick revision of looking at faces and having some sort of feedback from the students or the situation in the classroom to have a replan, kind of replan what you are going to do obviously with the support of your prior guide, right? But that's pretty much the idea. I think um, so far, that's pretty much the approach I follow. And uh, the interference comes when students' attitude is reluctant to uh, see the lesson plan as a guide and, and, tried, and they try to fulfill every single piece of whatever they plan. That's when I have to start working about uh, certain aspects in the teacher to try to help them to open themselves to all of these variations that may happen and may occur. I don't know if yeah, that there, kind of answers. Yeah, there's, there's a research method for collecting data that I think is important. And I mentioned earlier this idea of participatory action research or PAR. And I think it's important to mention this idea of uh, stimulated recall where you ask the participant, the, what were you thinking at this particular time? Let's say they're looking at a video of, uh, of their teaching practice and they're looking at the video, they're in front of the class doing something and the re researcher asks the, the teacher, what were you thinking when you said this? What were you thinking when the students were doing this? What were you thinking when you were writing the, on the board this, this particular thing? And the, the teacher then articulates the thought processes that were going through his or her mind at that particular time in that particular moment. And really that for me, I think is, is one of uh, the best ways to think about reflection and action and really see after the fact, what you were thinking during the fact and right, right. really trying to articulate that. And, and a lot of times this is not possible unless the class was recorded. Right. And uh, either audio or video, but 
you're able to recall looking at something right. that maybe was missed at the moment, right? Maybe there were some behavioral things that the teacher was not aware of at the time, but then when they're looking at the, the video or the listening back to the audio, they're reflecting what was going on at that moment. But this thing about reflection in action versus reflection on action, and then the planning that is thinking, actually reflecting right. before yeah. the action, um, I think is the idea here for me is to try to align those three, reflection before action, reflection in action, reflection on action, but trying to get the most out of each, but to recognize that they are different, they are separate, uh, but they all need to come together at some point um, and in some coherent way, looking back at how one closes this gap between the ideal self and current self. So I think it's um, it's worth mentioning uh, the importance of recording your practice. Yes. I think this is one of the hardest things to do for all of us, right, is to look back at our home practice and, it, it and watch and, and see things that maybe have gone well, but other things that, that maybe don't go so well. But I think it's a really important piece in really looking back and, and taking reflection to a new level, um, especially the reflection in action. And I keep talking about reflection in action because, again, I think that's where uh, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. I think this is where teachers right. really become better is being better at reflecting in action, this greater awareness of in the moment, being able to say, okay, this is what's going on. And these are, uh, you know, this is what should be going on. This is what's what's not going on that should be. Um, and, you know, I keep thinking about this book from uh, a good, a great author. He does a lot of, writes a lot of books on an assessment. Uh, his name's James Popham. And he wrote a book, Transformative Assessment, back in 2008. And one of the things he mentions about this idea of formative assessment is that we we choose moments in our teaching practice where <clears throat> we have to make adjustments and we have to incorporate this formative assessment that we actually have to make changes but we're not constantly doing it it's not a constant thing that we're constantly changing and changing it's really looking at those moments and you pd i think call it something like critical uh, teaching moments or something, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's similar. It's a similar idea, but you, you make, you identify those moments where you say, okay, I have to change something. This is something that's not happening that should be happening. And, and being able to become aware of those moments first and foremost. And then the second step then would be to make the appropriate actions. But I, I think that, the only well, not the only way, but I think the best way to do that is start getting used to recording and looking at yourself, your own practice, and then asking the, those questions. What was I thinking in those particular moments at that particular time? Right. I, I think, uh, yeah, you're covering, there are different ways to view this. There are, there are different authors about this. I, if I recall well, I think it's uh, Noonan who mentions about task plan and task in action, uh, focusing on the idea of planning, but undercovering the idea of reflection. Because uh, that's one strategy in, indeed to, to help students develop this skill of uh, doing the, the, the reflection in action, which is that you have a plan before, and then you come and perform, and then you have to re- uh, uh go through your plan again and restate your plan according to what actually happened in there and then make a comparison of the task plan and task in action and that's sort of a strategy to help students start uh making this kind of reflection obviously both of reflections moment reflective moments will be uh out of the moment uh out of the action uh knowing that in uh, they are beginners right but that's the, the idea that they can uh, compare themselves or, or try to um, have a retrospective of what actually happened and then make a comparison between what they originally planned and what it, what it actually changed, making what it actually happened, making a, a, a lot of stress in the changes for minimal changes or unexpected things or unplanned things that happen at the moment and the teacher had to do. And I think that's one strategy that I, I've done it before and it works. 
it helps the students to in this reflective process. What I'm doing right now, it's uh, following uh, the, the, the pattern we have here at our BA, which is uh, students plan. We have a session of planning with the students that, that uh, deliver the lesson plan before. And uh, in that session, I base myself on just focusing on them knowing exactly what they want to achieve and then let them tell, explain, tell, or, or rephrase, or put in words, whatever they want to do during the activities. Uh, like just having some uh, back talk, rephrasing what they say, so just to make clear for myself, and sometimes for themselves, if that's exactly what they want. And, and that strategy helps a lot to uh, make them aware of things they, they view in one, from, one, from one plane, and once you put it in words, they realize, are, oh, no, but I'm going to miss that or I'm going to need to do this, too. And that's uh, that's all I do. So they and they decide whether they change or not. I intervene with ideas when they request, when they actually tell me uh, what can I do here? I start with a couple of questions just to lead them towards the answer. And if they actually don't have an idea, I put on the table an idea which I forbid them to use. <laughs> I put on the table an idea which they have to uh, uh, just uh, here in order to create their own idea. So in after this session, they come and perform. After the performance, during the performance, we actually have videos. We are doing uh, live Facebook lives, which are not open to the public. It's just for the group or our private group on Facebook, because this recording creates a lot of anxiety in them, at least at the beginning, at least the first or the second, first and second recording. It's really stressing, and that's why the first, uh, during the first presentation, it's a little bit more open, so they know they have a feel of how is a, the how how is my approach for leading into this practice. Uh, so the teach and the way their feedback comes, the way they they feel when they are recorded, and little by little they forget about the recording. So by the third or fourth class, they are already on wheels with the recording, so they record themselves. And after the performance, we have a feedback session, and there's a whole there's a whole new story in which we talk about a, ref, a group reflection based on the giving feedback to the teacher. But it's a group reflection in which many things come up uh, from the observer that we have, from the students that acted at, as simulated students, and from myself, from the teacher himself to begin with. And we have this feedback session. Many of the aspects that we discuss in this end up with exactly something that you sort of mentioned. Go back to the video, watch the video, and watch this part of the class and make sense of this. And it's it, really important. Yeah, and it, yes. and, it's, and again, the thing about making sense of it is, again, not thinking only on in terms of reflection on action. It's trying to make sense of it, what you were thinking at the moment versus what you think now. And, and that, I think, is really the difference between the reflection in action and the reflection on action. The right. difference between those two perspectives is the learning process. Right. That is where they say, oh, you know what? I was thinking this at the time. I wasn't aware of this. But now, looking back on it and thinking about it, uh, I'm outside of the context now. I see that. Okay. And then they have that conversation. So it's, it, it, for me, it's a mistake if we're only reflecting on action. If we're just saying, oh, yeah. yeah. I should have done this. I should have. No, we need to the students and every teacher really, I think, needs to see the difference between, OK, I was thinking this right or wrong. You know, sometimes we're going to be right. Sometimes we're going to be wrong. And then looking at it later from another perspective and really looking at the differences between those perspectives. And then the final piece would be to compare all three, looking right. at the planning or the reflecting before mm -hmm. action and 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 you know drawing conclusions based on those three perspectives but it's really taking uh, those three pieces and and tr making sense out of those three pieces not ignoring uh, any any uh, any of the three right um right and, so and that's why we got the, the video in there also to help them and and indeed it depends that that uh, idea of uh, their reflection in action 
uh, it depends a lot on sometimes on the ability that you have to ask certain proper questions at the right moment to the teacher so they can start really thinking about that. I heard once somebody saying that, uh, why do you write what you felt in your reflection? How does that help? And I was like, well, uh, I think it's really, really important to uh, also uh, talk about and, and, and what you are feeling, what you are thinking at the moment. Exactly. And what is making you to uh, take different paths during the class? What, why do you, and that's why I start asking them, you have in your plan, you have this, and uh, why did you decide to do that? And sometimes they misinterpret with the idea that, oh, uh, he wants me to do follow my lesson plan and stick to the lesson plan. No, no, no. I'm just asking that question to see what makes you make that decision. What exactly you saw? What did you realize? And, uh, uh, And I think that helps a lot because then at the end of this feedback and uh, and, and these comments uh, frequently, and I think uh, like 99% of the times they are required to watch the video again in certain specific moments before planning their following class. Yeah, and just because we're using videos doesn't necessarily mean that they are reflecting in action. And Uh, there, there needs to be a level of honesty when we are looking at reflecting in our own practice and uh, reflecting in action, because obviously we can say things that may or may not be true in terms of what we were thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. And this makes me think of uh, Argyris and Sean's ideas of theory and use versus espoused theory, looking right. at the differences between the actual theory that is being used the, in reality versus mm -hmm what we as teachers say our theory is right you know right. so sometimes there's a difference between those two uh, for whatever reason and and uh, you know there's there's uh, many different reasons why that might be the case but the, i think that it's logical to to assume that these two do exist in the real world that that some of us may have an espoused theory a theory that we say that we have that may or may not actually be true or that may be interpreted in other ways with other people. So that kind of adds another level of complexity to this idea of a reflection. If we're looking at something and, and this makes me think of the ought self, the ought to self is mm -hmm. what are the expectations that let's say my tutor at an institution, I'm a teacher trainer and what does my tutor want to hear? Right. And what am I going to say to, to, to him or her uh, based on what, he or she wants to hear versus what I truly believe. And so that is, I think, another piece of this that when we look at closing this gap between the ideal self and the current self, we're also looking at closing the gap between the ought to self and the current self uh, when we have these outside so uh, forces, really, that right. that are kind of... Uh, creating a push and pull between the ideal self and the ought to self. You know, another example would be an institution that says, okay, you need to teach this particular way, right? You have to use this particular type of material or this platform, and you need to stick to this particular way of teaching. That is going to influence, obviously, how one reflects and tries to close this gap between either the ideal self or the ought to self. And those those could be different, um, and so so that's that's kind of another level of complexity to this whole puzzle. Right. And yes, uh, Dr. Sheffer was talking in the in the plenary we attend on Monday that uh, we teach this way because that's the way we were taught, right? <laughs> and and the, the external forces influencing us. I want to wrap up, Ben, because there's a lot to say about this, and there are many things that we can say. Uh, but one of the things uh, that I tend to do is that uh, we need to be conscious that, yes, there are a lot of things out there. There are a lot of theories. There is a lot of uh, technology. There is a lot. There are a lot of paths to follow. There are a lot of liars and there are a lot of uh, aspects that we can consider. But we have to, we as trainers, we have to, um, as teachers for majors, we have to uh, put ourselves, our feet on the ground and realize uh, the people we have in front, the teachers we have in front, and we have to uh, see what actually is the balance between the challenge and the capacities. 
And obviously, we will always be challenging our students, but not overwhelming their capacities to frustrate them and make them hate things that uh, reflection and planning for the rest of their lives. So uh, I have different um, approaches for reflecting and for coping with these ideas and uh, and, and all of them apply for the planning, for the in-progress uh, decision, for the, thing, for the uh, reflecting in action and reflecting on action. Uh, but I come up with this three, well, well, I didn't come up with them. I just ran into them, uh, three simple steps that can work. And this may uh, wrap up a little bit everything, uh, or most of the things we have said. The first thing in order to reflect in any plane would be describe the facts and thoughts. Make sure that you know uh, what actually happened and what you actually thought, believe, what you felt at that moment. Separate the facts from your thoughts. What, when, where. And uh, sometimes this is the difficult part and that's when we have to stop a little bit before getting to any other plane or any other level, because the students have to learn to differentiate simple things like what happened and what I thought at the moment. I, it looks simple. Yes, it looks simple. Believe me, it's uh, something complex because we have so many things in our minds that uh, that's indeed the problem with thought. Sometimes we do not realize that uh, things we believe are facts are not really facts, are thoughts that we have. And that uh, can get so extreme into the plane of the irrational or the plane of the, uh, I don't know, psychological problems. But right now it, it can be at a certain level in which the teacher, the practitioner uh, does not realize that he is giving facts that are really thoughts or the other way around. Yes. So the first step in this reflection would be clear your mind. Identify the difference between the happenings and the thoughts. State what, when, where, at difference of what I was thinking, what I was feeling, which would be the second step. Clarify your feelings. What I thought, it, it, between one and two, we have the what I thought and the what I feel. What that made me feel at that moment. What, feel, what is the effect of that feeling or that thought? What is the impact in the class? What decision do I make when I have these kind of feelings? Is it affecting or not? Many, a, a, a quick example, many times teacher said, I felt really nervous. And I was like, well, you didn't look like nervous. And sometimes they tell you, well, I felt really, really nervous and I didn't know what was happening in certain moments. And some others, uh, other teachers tell you, I felt really nervous, but I know I can handle it. I know I didn't show that. When, when I tell them, well, I didn't see that. And they tell you, yes, I, I know you didn't see it because I know I could handle it. And sometimes it's like, I felt really nervous and that, that messed up with my class. And I, I'm like, yes, that messed up with your class because uh, you started to mumble. You started to forget about even the language itself. You forgot about this and that and those things. Or, or through questions, they start to answer themselves about all of the, these aspects. So feelings, what I thought, what I feel, what I want. Uh, that's also, I, I need to clarify what I want. Or you can say what I wanted and what, I, and what really happened, all right? And, and that would be part of the reflection. Describe facts, describe thought, uh, differentiate between fact and thoughts, clarify your feelings, and then specify your behaviors. And that's how simple I want to put it today. And that's how simple I wanted to put it in, in, the, um, in the talk I gave on, on Tuesday. Uh, simple in quotation marks, right? Because it's simple to say. Sometimes it's really hard to do. Uh, specify your behaviors. You need a clear statement on, on what needs to be transformed. I don't like the word change that much, though I use it twice in here. Uh, uh, and uh, that's a, a, a B minus for me. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I would prefer to use the word transform, clarify what, what needs to be transformed and what needs to be reinforced also. Many students, uh, many teacher students uh, come 
come with the idea that uh, everything said on feedback has to be bad. And, and if they don't listen to anything bad, they feel they don't feel they had a, a, a proper feedback. And it's not about that. It, uh, it's also about the things that need to be reinforced, things we are doing right, and just making sure that the, student, that the teachers know why they actually did that on how or, or, or why is that helping the students to or, or just making them aware that it's a conscious decision. It's a phrase that I use a lot in my feedback sessions is if this was an accident, you need to reflect on how it came up because it worked as a charm. But if it's something you actually decided and planned to happen like that because of a reason, you need to reflect on that to reinforce that, that uh, way of deciding, that, that sort of decision. So you state in clearly what needs to be transformed and what needs to be reinforced and what possible alternatives come in there. These three steps can be approached from different angles, can be split into different uh, ways, uh, and uh, can be uh, covered or, 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 or um, protected by different um, people, authors, materials, articles, information. All of these aspects can be uh, covered by this, protected by theory if you want to. Uh, but the idea is that start reflecting in which moment at all moment. Yeah, those are really some some helpful tips, uh, Petey. I think looking at the, and understanding the difference between behaviors versus feelings uh, is really half the battle. Uh, if, yeah. uh, if if teachers can distinguish between what actually happened versus their interpretation of what happened. Uh, then you're you're halfway there. I mean, that's that's right. a, uh, sometimes a, a challenge, but I think an important distinction to make uh, w when you think about uh, reflective practice. Uh, to summarize, I would like to just briefly talk about some main points that I want to just kind of uh, make clear here as I, as I as we conclude for today's broadcast. The reflective practice for me is is complex and. I, I wanted to try to share with you today some certain relationships uh, between some internal learning context versus external, right. the difference between closing between the ideal self, the ought to self, and the current self. Um, but here's the good part of all, of all of this, I think, is that there are many different entry points or ways that one can start the reflective practice, and it's going to be different on based on the individual and the context, but. The good thing is that there's different ways to start, and you can start with just thinking about your current self and what what your current philosophy, educational philosophy is. You can think about your ideal self, where you would like to be, and also think in terms of some educational philosophy. You can think about how you want to attempt to close that gap if you've already identified those two things. You can try to begin understanding the literature, read articles and find out what other people are doing in terms of what you want to do in terms of closing this gap between the ideal and current self. You can open up more conversation or communication within your local context, your local personal learning network or your local institution to begin talking more with other educational uh, stakeholders you can open up more communication with experts external to your local context and really look at all of this as, yes, there's many different entry points, but the idea is that eventually, if you want to come, become a true reflective practitioner, the idea is to understand all of these aspects because they all influence each other, finding ways of incorporating action research or participatory action research into your own practice as well. But really trying to attack the idea or the notion of reflection from different angles, uh, as we've talked about today, really looking at the differences between reflect, reflection in action versus on action, and this idea of espouse theory and theory and use and understanding those, those differences and why those differences uh, exist is, I think, um, a, an important aspect of really being a true reflective practitioner that really sets out for one to improve, which is really the whole purpose, is if we can improve as teachers, then we improve uh, student outcomes, or we're more able to facilitate the process of 
uh, students uh, reaching higher academic achievements. And really that's the goal for, for all of us really, I think is right. defining ways that we can help students be uh, better, better individuals, better human beings, better learners and so on. Right. I couldn't agree more with you. The entry point can be at any, at anywhere. Uh, obviously our job may be, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but our, our job is to help students to realize which the entry points may be, at least give them options so they can find their own. And it may be not even the ones we are presenting, but the entry point may be any. And at the end, everything has to be aligned. And I like yeah. that word, aligned yeah. all of them. Yeah, the entry points can be anywhere, but that the entry point, the one or two entry points is not the only thing to the reflective practice. That's that's the main point I want to try to uh, communicate this morning is that it's, yes, you may, you may enter in any place. It's all good just getting started with the process of becoming a better reflective practitioner. But I think it's worth mentioning and understanding those other aspects of reflection so that we can uh, go a step further in the process so that we try to incorporate all these different ideas as they, I think, all come together for the same purpose. So Exactly. Until we come to uh, aligning everything in order to be a big, big network, a big community in which we all share and uh, align even the different paths that students have to take into their formation into one single thing, which is a teacher, which is uh, singular, but at the end, it's a plural task. Uh, ben, interesting talk today. Absolutely, Petey. I really uh, enjoyed today's uh, discussion. I want to thank everybody for uh, following us and watching today's live broadcast and also those who uh, are watching this as a recording. Feel free to leave comments below and let us know what you think about a reflection, reflective practice. Are you a reflective practitioner? What are things that you do in your current teaching practice? What are some things that you could do uh, to be a better reflective practitioner? We're uh, always uh, curious and interested to hear from you. And if you ever want to discuss your own reflective practice in a live broadcast, just reach out to us. We'd be happy to have you in this live broadcast. And uh, again, follow us on Facebook. All of the past recordings that we've created, we've this will be our 22nd recording now. Uh, you may access those, and uh, we make it as we try to make it as easy as possible for you to find uh, the different uh, vid uh, recordings that we have created thus far in Teacher Learning Cast. But we want to thank everyone for uh, watching this broadcast and give us feedback. Let us know what you would like to hear, what you would like to talk about and have us to discuss as well. And we'd be happy to take those, take on those requests. Right, I just wanna thank people that joined today in the Facebook live transmission, Oscar Castro, Vero Duron, Dante from Zacatecas, Alma Zaragoza, Luis de la Fuente, great conferences with Luis, uh, Soraya Castro, uh, Javier uh, Costeñito, he also joined us today. Um, uh, Hugo Cesar, Andrea Orozco, Claudia Hasso, my lovely, eh, Gaby Padilla, Jacqueline Martínez, Carmen Llamas, Noemi Mora, Elsa, Elsa Primita, Oscar Guzmán, Saraí. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for start leaving at least the hello in, in the Facebook. I hope uh, you can take at least uh, some practice from this. Or please, I would like to listen about what you think about what we discussed today because it's really important. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching, and we'll see everyone in the next live broadcast next week. Keep on learning.